Um, Lexi, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm good too. Um, are you recovered from your midterm this morning? Are uh, we recovered from your midterm this morning? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Lexi, Lexi came to my midterm today um, and uh, was really gracious. And then I realized it on the same day of, of the lecture, which is <laughs> a lot. <laughs> We've just a lot. And I may come to your house after for like a, a, a barbecue. So it's just basically like all digital. A lot of, a lot of Fika, Fika Lexi Zoom, for sure. Um, yeah, I see people popping in. Uh, if you do want to turn your camera on, that's awesome. Just because otherwise you feel a little lonely. But if you also just prefer to be undercover in your um, personal space, that's fine too. But it's just it's just nice to see some some uh, faces. So today, uh, you know, it's really more of a salon. Lexi calls it a picnic for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I, I want everybody to bring like their drinks or bring like um you know like like a glass of wine or something. It just feels like a I don't yeah. know. It's not appropriate for people who students who have midterms, but <laughs> well, whatever relaxes you, exactly right. So it doesn't have to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, we we've prepared a massive presentation for you, which I will share with you right now. It has. Too many slides. All right, so uh, I'll just post that into the Zoom chat right now. Um, one second, and then we'll we'll start the presentation in a minute. All right, so here, so this is kind of a working document that you know you all have access to that you can um, edit and look at, and um, basically we're going to be working with that through. Uh, through the next hour or so, and um, it kind of contains my slides and then the presentation, Lexi's presentation as well. All right, so I'm already sharing my screen. I'll move all of you to my second screen. Um, hey, Celeste. <laughs> oh my God, our, our truest fan is back. <laughs> very, very grateful. All right, so um, what are we talking about today? Activism. Uh, as some of you know, part of a four-part series, there's actually only one left after this, which is now we have basically a month break, uh, uh, which is going to be about hybrid practice. So talking about the future of you know, practice kind of after COVID and how it affects us. And there's two already, so if you miss them, there's, they are recorded. I think they're not online yet on the page, on the TSA page, but they, they should come come on there um, in the near future, hopefully. Um, uh, they're, they're for sure documented. But for today, so we'll basically uh, have a mini introduction by me. Uh, Lex is going to present about her work. We've got, this is going to lead into a short discussion. And then I have sort of another another kind of like presentation where I talk about, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this sort of activism from a bit of a meta perspective uh, uh, over the last few months and, you know, especially for this presentation. So I kind of break it down into six types of activism within architecture and we can, we can discuss that and kind of think about moving forward with that. Um, so just uh, to start, you know, this is, this is one, uh, there, there's many definitions of uh, what, architecture activi what, what activism within architecture means, but um, this is one that I found kind of useful maybe as a starting point. Um, uh, typically defined as one who uses design as a tool for political change. Um, an activist architect can be more simply described as one who takes architectural practice with with him or her commits to a community and engages with that community's building needs. We'll see that that's not a full definition. I think there, there it goes way way beyond that. But I kind of like the idea of taking taking these tools on a journey with you wherever you go. Um, and so, one thing I, I I noticed, which I just want to put out there, I'm not really sure what to make of it, but the the term activism has really exploded very recently. Like. Um, 
in the you know in the eighties there was basically a, a fifth of that term. Uh, uh, well, that, so this is how often it appears in books that are um, that are accessible by Google. So it is kind of like you know probably even more extreme if you consider all the articles and all the internet-based search. So this is really just within within actual books. So you can imagine that this this term you know is is really just very widely used. And I want to actually start off with a short video talking about what activism maybe it's not. Um, Can you hear? Oh. You can't hear it? Not really. Oh, oh Not it's super quiet. quiet. Uh, okay. How do we... I, I, you may want to reshare or I can share and make sure that I sh to share with the um, audio clicked on. That might be a way to do it. Do, do you want to share your screen, you mean? Or? Yeah, I can try to do that. Do you want me to... Maybe if you stop sharing for a second, let me try. Mm -hmm. Let me see if this works. To share the, um, the link again so you guys can, I can share also access our computers screen. now. Uh, okay, can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, let me see. Um, Oops. Lexi to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> okay. You know, this, this idea of purity okay. and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff. I, you should get over that quickly. The world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids. And, you know, share certain things with you and 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 i think that what one danger i see among young people particularly on college camps is malia and i talk about this yara goes to school with my daughter um but i do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people and this is accelerated by social media there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people and that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or used the word wrong verb or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get on TV, <laughs> watch my show, watch Gronish. <laughs> um, you know, that's not, that's not activism. That, that's not bringing about change. You know, if, 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 if all you're doing is casting stones, uh, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get that far. That's easy to do. Okay. I think that's a really good transition, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you should just keep the, the slide on. So this is this is what I'll be talking about in the second part. So yeah, like you just just take over. But I wanted to, you know, in a way, start by a negative definition at least for tonight in terms of what maybe activism is not. <laughs> I mean, I like that that Barack Obama is kind of like setting the stage for me to be like, I don't always have to be correct because I think that that is part of what um, figuring out how to do activism is about. That about kind of like trying to be from a certain place and figuring out how to to you know, really build build an idea, a set of an ideas, but also build a community around a set of ideas. Um, and I think that this really started for me recently in writing. Uh, with oh, the wait, Lexi, sorry, can I introduce you really quick before you go oh, into your sure. <laughs> um, So just want to say, uh, you know, Lexi 
is um, an architect has her own firm called Soft Firm and uh, uh, based in New York City, you know, building really, really cool um, things in New York and beyond and just finishing a big project up very soon. And she's also um, an educator and has uh, uh, graduated from Yale, has been teaching there, has been teaching at Cooper Union, really all the good schools around, uh, uh, around the area that we're in. And, um, but she has also, you know, I think throughout her practice, but I would say especially in the last few months, um, uh, worked what I would or kind of like build an activist practice. And um, it's funny because when I invited her to speak today, she was like, well, I, what, am I, am I qualified for this? Am I an activist, you know? And so again, this definition is, is, is so, um, it, it's, it's vague, right? And people maybe don't necessarily feel it's never enough and it's not, ne- but it's, it's, it's sort of hard to really define yourself as that. But, you know, as you will see in, in her presentation, she has actually participated in lots of different ways in, in, in activist practice. And I think it's a really interesting, um, uh, thing that she's doing. So just wanted to say that and please, please, please take it away. You've introduced me twice today and both times have been really complimentary. Thanks, Sika. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, just, just kind of how this thing started was that um, I went to Yale and um, Yale didn't really acknowledge the George Floyd, um, yeah, the murder of George Floyd. And so we all kind of got together and wrote a letter. And this is just like showing that there are like 241 edits and there's just so much kind of um, writing about this. And it was super exciting to do and also really exciting to um, also pull like the, we actually got 700 signatures in like 12 hours. And a lot of this also was like the, the letter came out from Columbia, like all these letters were coming out and it was just like this momentous kind of feeling of also banding together with different schools. Um, so we definitely had conversations with other schools as well. And, you know, the jury's still out on how, what these letters really did, you know, they did hold schools accountable and they had to, schools had to respond. And, um, you know, in some ways, like the school is kind of like a corporation. And so there's a little bit of corporate like mitigation strategy that happens in terms of how the school responds, but it definitely raises a conversation that I think was really important. So we did a lot of kind of research for ourselves and in terms of creating kind of anti-racist, you know, um, uh, an anti-racist self-guided syllabi and also thinking about other organizations that were active. Um, But also I think one thing for me was that I'd started to look into Yale's history and, um, you know, and like in the 19, late 1968 um, and, and a few years prior to that, there were different architecture groups that were really kind of gaining momentum, including like protests where they were like um, uh, protesting tuition and they actually like created a casket for, you know, an imaginary um, art and architecture student um, to to protest how much the tuition cost. And there was also like the Black Panther and Black Power movement that was that was kind of around. And what was interesting was that there was a group of architects um, and students that were brought to Yale and um, they actually formed their own workshop on that was had its own storefront outside of the architecture school and it was called the Black Workshop. And the interesting thing about the Black Workshop is that it, they actually work with the community. So there were a lot of, um, you know, community design councils that were part of these Black Power movements. So the idea that you could be part of a Black Power movement, but then you could also have architects and designers that were wor- really working with your community really directly. And that's not really how our, you know, our activist groups um, work in the current day, but it was just really refreshing to think about like New Haven and Yale, which, you know, has the building project, but at a certain time they were really actually proposing real projects that were quite successful within the community. Um, and what was so contentious about this is that at a certain point they demanded 50% um, people of color as, in terms of their admission. And um, they actually sent out their own letters of admission, like without approval from, from like the, the main school, um, even though they had an alliance with the urban design department. So there was a fire at the ANA building and that black workshop also dissolved for a couple of other reasons as well. So, but just knowing that in 1968, there was really this call of 
what does architecture do with racism? Like, what is the relationship between design and the built environment? What is the relationship between our responsibility to um, the communities that are around us and also designing, you know, within communities and looking like the people we're designing for, which I think is, is still an open question today. So we wrote this um, article that was hypercritical of Yale and basically said 52 years later, like it's exactly the same and there's only one student who's graduating from Yale that's black. Um, and this was really hard for me because I was a professor at Yale. I, uh, or I had been a professor, I had been a student. Um, you know, there was, there's part of it where you're like, do I want to stick my neck out? And should I be worried about whether they're, they're going to invite me back? But, you know, it's just started to get to a point where I felt like they weren't responding, um, you know, as, as forthrightly as they could. And we're had a lot of excuses about not having enough money, which I, I think is, I still, I'm still really critical of that viewpoint. Um, and I think that in general, just like my path to teaching has really been, you know, kind of fortuitous in terms of just, you know, getting a, actually, I think that Yolanda Daniels, who has taught at a bunch of different schools, she's um, a, a pretty prominent black um, female architect. And I think that she asked me if I would do it in a way also supporting me as a, as a young architect, but also because I'm a, a woman of color, I think. So just this kind of idea of a network of people who are really supporting each other in this, but also supporting, you know, this question of, of and this was at, at Cooper Union, this was posted on the wall. Um, and I, I love Cooper Union because they're like super, you know, vocal about tuition and about everything. And they kind of just have this uh, tradition of protest. But somebody wrote not enough female professors. And then there were like, what about blacks? What about other races? Like, um, while we're complaining, not enough work either somebody wrote a relevant curveball and men talking to men about other men. So there's definitely like, I think, you know, when you're within a power structure of either being faculty and trying to write a letter to a dean or whether you're a student trying to write a letter to a professor, there's part of this activist, you know, cause that, that requires you to, to really think about your position of power and privilege and also like how you've gotten there, but also how you leverage that with other people. So um, I, I did this for the, the office hours, which is a, um, a, you know, another kind of forum for BIPOC students, but thought, thought about a little bit about what getting, becoming a licensed architect means. Like, what does it mean to become an associate at a firm? And what, is, what are the pros and cons of becoming an adjunct professor? And like the thing about the, I, I found the licensed architect and the associate, it was just, you know, like when you think about NCARB and NAB, like, you know, there's just, there's just a real lack of representation. Um, and I think within my own teaching, this happened during ADR too, but because of COVID, we kind of had to adapt to, um, you know, just a challenging learning environment. And so we would ask the students to make things live in Google Slides. They had to make their own kind of um, final assignment, which we called a spatial quarantine. Um, but we just did a lot of fun things in Zoom and I feel like they responded well and we also had a lot of fun, but it also felt like we were challenging the idea of the teacher as kind of the authority figure um, and really trying to collectively come up with um, something that, that we could give each other comments on. And um, the other thing that I teach at, at Columbia is ADR1, which is um, where we kind of study canonical buildings. And this is the list on the left is like the list of the canonical buildings that were happening last year. Um, and on the right is the new list that we've created. And I just underlined in red, like all the women or the people of color that we were teaching. So, I mean, I think that speaks to Obama's point of kind of being like, you know, there, there are times when you're actually within this problem, like that you're part of the problem. And realizing that and doing something about it um, is super important. Um, so yeah, we just changed the list to, to really include like borders and you know um, mosques like ecological like the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig or the Princess Diamond um, cruise ship that had you know um, lots of kind of different impacts on COVID, for example. So just really thinking about how architecture like radical ways of living and different kinds of politicized architectures like exist outside of the Western canon. So just rethinking this idea of what do you teach in the first year? What does that mean? And how is teaching a form of activism in terms of just, you know, introducing people to the idea that there isn't the can canonical version of architecture that a lot of people say. 
Um, uh, another thing that's been going on that's really exciting is the um, uh, office hours um, kind of initiative. And this has been really great because it's really giving students like hands on, you know, um, very like didactic, like, how do you do this? Um, and it's an hour and it's, it's BIPOC only, which I think is an interesting, you know, stance and what makes office hours powerful is that it is BIPOC only. Um, and I think that a lot of, you know, it's been really amazing to be on some calls where like, by, like black, I mean, black architecture students, for example, are like, there's a sea of architecture students here that look like me and I'm not siloed in my school by myself, you know, that there are other people out there that kind of look more like me, which I think has been really exciting for people. I just wanted to plug this too, is that on October, and I know that Danielle Smoller sent out an email earlier today about harassment and discrimination. So I feel like this is the perfectly timed thing, but we're doing a, um, an office hour where that's, that's really a workshop about responding to discriminatory incidents. And I, I think that in general, a lot of, a lot of people have face discrimination, you know, for, for a whole host of different reasons. And how do you actually respond to that live, like while it's happening and actually do something about it, you know? Um, so this is being led by this person named Lee Minwa, who's read, who, um, actually directed The Color of Fear, which is a super influential educational video that I would highly recommend everybody to watch. Um, and I, I just put some of these things in here because they were part of office hours, but it's really kind of about my own, you know, my own training as a, as a young architect, like getting out of school and working for different architecture firms and really feeling like I wanted to challenge just the idea of what like the, you know, signature architect really meant having worked for some famous people and some people who had small kind of shops. Um, I feel like at a certain point, I just decided that working for an office was, um, wasn't, and working for somebody else and doing iterations wasn't what I wanted to do. So part of it was kind of turning to friends and starting to work with them while I was teaching and calling it soft firm with the idea that like firm, like the idea of having a firm is really kind of actually a nebulous thing. And we said soft firm because it kind of reminds us of tofu and mattresses and, you know, a bunch of other different things. So um, the formation of that, like, I think was really part of also thinking about a practice that was where it was three of us who are, are all graduates of Yale and we're all Chinese American and, and thinking about how we kind of like look at typologies and also spatial practices that are within our own culture that are vernacular and that create, you know, um, different formats and different ways of, of valuing, you know, um, spatial practice. Um, and we did this seminar, we've actually, maybe just also through Instagram and the internet, um, like uh, somebody reached out to me who's been really interested in um, supermarkets in Argentina, Chinese supermarkets in Argentina, and um, asked me to come to their seminar um, that they call non-domestic. And this is another project we did where we had we thought of this empty parking lot and reimagined it with affordable housing with a, um, a garden on the top and a plant shop and supermarket on the, the ground floor. Um, just with the idea that like, you know, buildings can kind of be activists in, in and of themselves in terms of creating an economy for the inhabitants within it. And also just thinking about like, you know, a, a, a space that, you know, you could sell plants to, to hipsters in a gentrifying neighborhood, but also provide like a beautiful garden on the roof for, for senior citizens, for example. Um, and I think this collaboration in terms of just also thinking about design objects as movable and not necessarily like fixed kind of um, monolithic buildings is also part of our practice. So in this seminar, we actually asked um, all the students to draw their rooms during COVID. And then we tried to fit them all into the glass house. So just this idea of like messing up the master's house. Um, and so some of these collages are a little bit about that, about challenging the perfection of um, what canonical buildings are and who actually gets to inhabit them. Um, so like after a birthday or um, a family. And these were all sold as part of the design yard sale, um, which was actually started by one of my former students. Um, super proud that they did that. They raised a lot of money. Um, but in, another thing that was going on during the last couple of months is that there have been kind of new collectives that have formed. So this is um, a group that was formed called BIPOC Bosses. Um, and this is another group on the right. Um, this is called Women in Practice. And it's kind of, they formed actually before kind of George Floyd and all of that stuff. But I think that in general, one hard thing about architecture is that all of us end up competing against each other. 
And in turn, for a lot of competitions, it's like a lot of people that are peers are actually put into the same space of competition. And also, you know, there it, there are incentives in order for for the like the city gives us you know um, cert more opportunities if you do qualify to be a minority and win women business enterprise. Um, and I think that a lot of us were thinking about like what would happen if we all banded together as one team. Um, like what would happen if we were no longer competing against each other to be like the only singular, you know, person of color within the competition, but that together we kind of made so it, like an organization that was greater than, you know, um, any of us alone. Um, and yeah, we thought it started to think about it like what could it be like an agency model where you get a job and there, there are certain people who group together in order to work on it um, while they still run their own practices at the same time. Um, and now kind of the last thing that I've been working on and thinking about is this thing called Dark Matter University. Um, and this, um, this forms, uh, J uh, Justin Garrett Moore has been teaching this class at Yale, but at the same time, he's been teaching it at Tuskegee. Um, and the idea is kind of like with a Zoom format, he can have like teach twice as many students and they can also be in the same space together. So super powerful in terms of like, what does it mean to like teach in this Zoom format and how can, you know, like teachers from different schools kind of band together. And part of it is to say that like forming our own university outside of the universities that we're siloed in is, the, is a way to kind of create and leverage power. So this is, we just had our open house on October 4th, but um, we're really talking about how to reimagine the institution with new forms of knowledge and knowledge production, new forms of institution, new forms of collectivity and practice, new forms of community and culture and new forms of design. Um, and so we have a couple of different groups that are working on things, including broadcasting curriculum and campus. Um, and it's been just been super exciting to think about how like you could take the campus plan and like rethink of it in a virtual space. So it's no longer kind of a, you know, a formalized Columbia, but it's thinking about like the broadcast tower as like, you know, a, a radio station that we're starting or the cafeteria as the WhatsApp that has like 45 people on it and is constantly like chatting and being super sassy, you know, like I, it thinking about what does a university do and what are the ways that you can kind of create a university outside of the normal confines of what it means to go to like an Ivy League school. Um, and also thinking about like traditions that, you know, I think that we are in some ways at Columbia siloed into the idea of the Ivy League education and are missing out on like a lot of things that are happening at historically black colleges and universities like, um, like Howard or um, you know, the idea of, of like having a homecoming or having kind of like these different types of rites and rituals are things that um, I feel like we're getting more exposed to because DMU is a collection of, of people. Um, and uh, we also created Zotero, which is like a new um, uh, form of organizing, you know, readings and stuff. And so we are using meta tags, which is kind of like our own like dark matter university decimal system. So like collecting all of the readings into a new library online is, is also something that we've been working on. Another cool thing that we've been doing is using Adobe Comp, which is a way that you can use graphic design on your phone. And so you can create a library of assets and then throw those assets into a uh, paper space and upload it for other people to see. Um, so that's been super fun is that we've been and our rule is kind of like nobody designs the poster by themselves. At least two people have to touch the poster before it goes out. So kind of forcing this idea of collective design. Um, and also we've been doing stuff with it, the election too. So um, uh, Design as Protest has been uh, also organizing their own kind of rollout of, of asking people to make slogans and signs and thinking about how we could actually make that into like almost like a physical monument or barricade, um, you know, closer to the election. and. We've been teaming up with different organizations like New York Review of Architecture has been doing something similar. And then also A83, which is a new gallery, is interested in printing a lot of them. Um, I'm just showing some of the, you know, like, you know, we're, we're making some pretty stuff, but we're also doing like deep, deep organization and trying to figure out how we as an organization bring more people on and also have hierarchy, but then also can it's like fluctuate between bottom up and top down. Um, and so a lot of it is really kind of these open forums where also thinking about how the group makes decisions together. And I think that 
that has been super exciting to see how something like a Google form that is like, do you have a class that you'd like to teach for DMU and putting it into a survey and then thinking about how we're creating kind of our own universe of courses and our own, you know, connections between different professors. Um, and I think the thing that we're working on now or we're going to be working on is creating a course catalog that I think is taking after the whole Earth catalog um, kind of precedent of you know, a, a compendium of things where it's just an access to tools and an access to information. So I think we may work with A83 and they have a RISO graph printer, but I'm super excited to be doing that. So that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, how's that? That's awesome. Thank you, Lexi. That was really, really um, exciting. And I mean, you know, I think pretty clear that you're very qualified to talk about this. Um, so <laughs> I would love for everyone to go to the doc and actually spend a few minutes um, filling out these two questions. Um, just kind of thinking a little bit about, you know, if we're talking about activism, I guess the first the first thing is to identify an issue, right? <laughs> like what's what's the problem? What what are some problems that you could see um, at the moment that you know, or or in general? And just remember you're you are anonymous in the doc, like we don't see who's writing what. Um, but so basically the first question on page 46, is that possible, 46? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on page 46 is what are some issues you see at GSAP and beyond? So if you're not, you know, at GSAP currently or just sort of, but I think thinking sort of locally about like actual current level things within your community um, could be a helpful thing. and. Don't, you know, those issues are not necessarily, don't have to be something you have, you're thinking about changing at the moment, but just sort of what are some issues. And then uh, the second question is, how, how can you imagine some of these issues being addressed from in a bottom up way? So in a kind of self organized or organized way that isn't, so not, not in a way where, well, the issue can only be addressed if the director does that, right? But like, how, how, how could you start thinking about, um, any kind of organizing that would help build movement towards changing this, these issues. So let's take some thinking time really for the next five minutes um, and then we'll reconvene um, and talk about the six types of activism that I've, that I've uh, mentioned before. Um, I don't know, Lexi, if you have some good music to play. <laughs> oh. I think I have to share in order, well. Oh, sure. Um, you may have to share. Maybe maybe somebody can play. I can play it on my phone. No, no, it's fine. I can, I can find something. <laughs> um, I just always play calming, calming music for these things. <laughs> So wait, I have to get go share and then oh I guess I can can I only share my music? No, I'll just share my screen anyway. Okay. There's some good stuff in here for sure. Can you hear it? Very quiet.
I think Bika's gone. I don't see her. This has happened to me on a review where I was on somebody's review and their computer froze and they were gone. <laughs> oh, that, well, that happened the last time actually her oh, yeah. computer froze, but oh, I think, really? okay. oh yeah, because oh. she passed on the host to someone else. Jean is the host. Oh. She's probably going to come back in. <laughs> yeah, she's going to come right back. Yeah, I don't see her. I think this is, there's a lot of stuff about the administration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I would be curious to know from you guys, I mean, just if you guys want to turn your mics off or whatever about how you felt the activism has been at GSAP, like, um, I mean, like the, the letter that was written, the kind of um, unlearning whiteness, like there's a lot of integration of that into studios, it seems like, you know, I'm, I mean, I think the, the kind of the line between what is performative and then what is like real is like always kind of in question here, but I would love to hear from you guys. I mean, we're making a really good list, but I'd love to hear from you guys more about what you think about that. Or Celeste, if you could, you could also talk about anything that's been going on at your institution slash, you know, workplace or whatever too. Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think. <laughs> I've been kind of isolated down here since the beginning of the year, so. Um. You're like, I'm at, I'm at home and everything here is great. <laughs> like in terms of literally in like the suburbs in Georgia. And I've been in this red room for since like April 1st. <laughs> so, like, yeah. <laughs> everything I see, I see for Zoom. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any thoughts? I feel like I might just end up calling on some of my former students who are on this call. <laughs> You guys must have thoughts about um, how kind of, you know, that you guys all read that letter from the students at Columbia too. Yeah. And um, are all of your studios like trying to integrate like unlearning whiteness? Is that happening? Or I know the first year students are, but. Um, I was gonna say, I, I taught a public interest technology seminar over the summer mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that the timing is very interesting because we would, we definitely, it was top of mind as we, it, it was only three weeks long, so it was definitely top of mind as we um, proceeded through the course, but this, the workshop turned into a seminar this fall, and since the, the topic is public interest technology, you know, it is, um, you know, leading us to like have some of those more challenging conversations and, and it's trying to um, uh, help the students kind of like recognize the dynamics in some of the communities that, that they, you know, like we have to reach out to um, for engagement. Like you said, I think someone said very much extractive than empowering. So thinking about how to, you know, empower and lift and not just kind of like take and discard so totally i mean there i mean camille just put this in here but that the i think that one thing that happened was they created a kind of way to track the response of the school and like whether the demands had really been met and you know the different things along the timeline of what was going on which you know is an interesting way to kind of use technology to hold people accountable, accountable. You know? um yeah i i feel like I mean, everybody's being shy right now, but if you guys have thoughts about it, like, you know, do you feel like it made a difference? I mean, obviously, you know, there's, you can't ask, and institutions are really clunky, which I think is, and like kind of slow and, you know, and it, there's definitely, I think that I was trying to show and like the thing that I was talking about was like the, you know, I think that I started working with the institution and then kind of just got frustrated and was kind of like, mm -hmm. I should just do something outside of it. So, um, yeah, but I feel like what's nice right now is that like all the students are also being hypercritical of what their education is and like yep. you know, what what people are telling them and also like, you know, I think that unfortunately a year ago we like we all were putting Scandinavian scale figures in every single thing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, yeah. So maybe moving on to the slide 47 in terms of what do you, how can some of this be issue addressed from the bottom up? Hey, Mika. 
actually. Yeah, oh my god, I don't know what's <laughs> happening with those sessions. Um, maybe because they're in the evening, I was having <laughs> a problem, but I, I'm back. That's all okay. right. We were just chatting. Yeah, we had a. Okay. Uh, now, of all the different times that my that my computer could decide to overheat, this was probably the best one. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I wanted to chime in. Like, yeah. Some, I was also a writer of one of the student letters this summer, awesome. and so um, we kind of have. We're still in the middle of this process, but we've sort of had many opportunities to meet with. So I wrote the urban planning action plan and letter. And so we've actually continued to meet with faculty and with um, Wei Ping, who's the program director. And I think we actually just got invited to speak with the dean. But I think through these, all these conversations, I think we're very grateful that they're happening, right? And that these people who have very busy schedules, especially with everything else going on, they're giving us their time and having these conversations. But at the same time, the conversations have not been very fruitful in that I think, so the, the first reaction we got was sort of, um, and I don't wanna say anger, but like frustration at the way that we were um, proposing these things. And I think there was a sense that we had overstepped our bounds as students by demanding that like professors review their syllabi and make sure that you know, you're incorporating anti-racism because I think in planning especially, and also in architecture in general at GSAP, like, if you're building in America, it's impossible not to engage with race and the effects of racism on the, on the people that you're building for. And so I think as a group of students, we really, we were, we felt that and we were very convicted. And we just, we wanted the faculty to kind of be on our side. And instead the response was kind of like, well, it's not really like there's this idea of academic freedom once you're a tenured professor, right? Mm. That you get to teach whatever you want and no one can really uh, tell you otherwise, including your students. And, and I think because we kind of came out strong, there's still this resistance to kind of like play on the same side. And so that's been incredibly frustrating. And I think Lexi, what you said earlier about Columbia being this uh, like slow, slow turning institution, um, we've definitely felt that. And I think we're still as a group struggling to kind of figure out where our place is in this moment because I think like for once it seems like the message has hit home and on the higher levels like you know we see them all talking about this and there is an anti-racism uh, committee and like those things didn't exist before yeah, yeah exactly but uh, at the same time like I so I'm in Mario Gooden's studio and so obviously we are talking about race. It pervades like every class. And, and for that, I'm grateful because I think after the summer, if that weren't the case, I would have been incredibly frustrated. Yeah. But at the same time, I have other classmates who have told me it's kind of like business as usual. And I think the MR program is particularly guilty of this where you just get like funneled into production mode where you're kind of expected to produce things and like stop thinking because you're just rushing to meet that deadline and you don't have space to like think things through um, fully. So anyway, sorry, long spiel. No, I'm that was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like like getting really angry on Zooms is like really cathartic for people. And also I feel like, yeah. I, feel like I, you know, like that's, that's, that's my jam for sure is just to, to go off. But I, I think that you're right, like there's like, I think that's the hard part about it is like, you know, um, there's always like the Dean is always also talking about like getting money also from like, you know, the whole university. Like there's always a kind of, you know, a, a line of culpability and like in like that or a lack of culp culpability that is kind of similar to blaming the pipeline, you know what I mean? In the opposite direction of like, you know, so I think that finding um, other outlets to kind of and it, it's been really interesting to be like also Asian American and be thinking about like Black Lives Matter as an Asian American and also thinking about how like as a minority in schools there's a, like kind of an overrepresentation of of Asian people in in the schools as well and so I think that you know a lot of the kind of work that I've been really trying to do more is like also thinking about myself and my own person as it relates to race, you know? And so I feel like I've been talking to a lot of other Asian American architects as well. And, you know, like, so I, I think that 
figuring out what like how to pick your battles in terms of um, your own education and also I mean, not to say that like the school shouldn't continue to get resistance from you guys but that you know the that don't be don't be too down on yourself that that's what's going on because I think that like um, a lot I think that there is going to be a thing where it's like new grounds for design education where a lot of people got together like because I guess I mean, letters were written at like basically every architecture school. And um, I think a lot of us are, are checking in with each other and seeing what like what happened. But I predict that like the that the, the response to it is kind of like it's just been too slow. So yeah, anyways, Vika, I'm we're going into your time. <laughs> no, no, I mean, this is actually perfect. Um, I'm happy to have I think these are the exactly discussions that we want to be having. Um, Anybody want to add anything before we move on? There's uh, some really, yeah, after just reading the slide, there's some really uh, good, <laughs> good comments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some yeah. serious uh, stuff, you know. Uh, interesting that the lack of transparency is something that keeps coming up here, um, which is something that even as faculty, I can agree with, and then at the same time, you know, uh, what's interesting is that this is there's, there's also a, a over over too much transparency in terms of everything being recorded, right? This is being recorded, um, so it's very semi-private actually, and I think that that discussion got even much more intensified over Zoom, where in a way the transparency up is hasn't improved, but then they see much more of what we're doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's and this is also nice. being recorded, too. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is that this is being recorded. I mean, you know, I, th I think that that's the whole... In the end, in education, you'll never get away, in, in especially American education, which is, uh, you know, uh, privatized to some degree, or, or, or schools like Columbia that are private schools, in the end, that... that you know, you'll never get beyond the paradox that you're in the end paying a lot of money to be critical or that you're that you're that you're part of this system that itself is exploitative. And even if you're radical and uh, activist or whatever you want to call it within that you're you're part of it, right? You're part of, of that system as a student, as an educator, all these things. And I think sometimes when you're in it, you, it's also it's also easy to forget. But I think that's why a lot of these conversations often are yeah, kind of fraught or, or feel feel not genuine, but I think that that's um, that's something that you you can also grapple with, and it is interesting, and it's that in the end it still ends up being one of the most fruitful um, places that I've encountered to talk about these things. And 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 you know, I guess in defense of GSUP, I find that just GSUP is and has been in my in my experience very open, and the fact that we can do this panel, you know, like or panel with this this, this this picnic is <laughs> is is good and it's and, and very freeing as an educator because other schools I've encountered. You know, there 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 is a there's culture, like Lexi mentioned, Cooper has a tradition of questioning things of, of almost like activist student body. And again, that has to do with the financials of the school as well, right? The students there don't pay tuition. So from the outset there's a very different kind of expectation um, of the relationship between the student and the and the system. Um, but yeah, um, that actually leads nicely into, into I guess, my, my six points, um, which, you know, is essentially a really an expansive, uh, a big picture and incomplete research on current activism and architecture. And it's a wormhole, like once you get into it, it just keeps going and there's more and, and, and you know, this is really just a glimpse into it. But I wanted to share some of these projects because um, you know, uh, again, with this working doc, it allows you to go in and, and check them out. And a lot of them have very current programming and events. And so, yeah, let, let, let's just maybe kind of run through these and then hopefully, you know, uh, just continue the discussion. So please feel free to keep on posting into the chat any further ideas about the ongoing discussion about these two questions and slides and then also anything you see here that you find interesting or that you want to talk about if you want to talk more about a certain a topic or theme I'll basically browse through them super quickly and so we can the idea is that I you know 
run through it and then we can come back to them if you want to talk about any individual uh, organization a little bit longer. So the first group that I've identified is, you know, activism within a profession. So I guess this, <laughs> this conversation could, could be classified as that. So sort of like people, people who are within the profession trying to change the profession. Um, and, you know, uh, also, just a footnote, I mean, all these classifications, a lot of organizations and people and, uh, could be in, in, in various classifications, they're not strict at all, like mo most of them are actually kind of hybrid, but I find it, it's always helpful to kind of break things down into groups and then just to make it a little bit easier to um, kind of understand the whole field of what is out there. So the first one actually is pretty GSEP related, it, it was founded in 2011. And it's called Who Builds Your Architecture? And that was a discussion I remember vividly because it was the reason I came to TSAP really. I mean, not, I didn't know about organization, but it was sort of this idea, you know, I was working for, for a big, uh, not, not big actually, it was kind of boutique, but they were, they were basically, our work was entirely disconnected from the construction side. And it was always, um, we didn't, I didn't know who was building my architecture. And when I was asking these questions in the office, it was, didn't seem like an accepted question. And so, um, you know, I felt I needed some some uh, more insight into the whole process of architecture, which includes the building of it. And so, um, this group, you know, is uh, uh, kind of has been asking the whole the whole um, purpose of it is to ask these questions: whether the architects ethical responsibilities towards those who erect their buildings around the world. So, you know, thinking about that that end of the process, and they have a series of guidelines. Here's just two that took out on the website, so kind of like a graphical, very architectural representation, kind of like guiding people through, through um, let's say, an ethical way of thinking about them. Another example of, you know, act, let's say activism, and again, using activism very broadly within the profession, is the architecture lobby, and specifically, um, actually this month they have an, um, an event series on architecture labor, and, uh, you know, here, I think what's interesting about sort of activism is also uh, there's a ter there's a certain terminology that comes with it. So here, um, you know, uh, that that often comes from uh, actually Marxist <laughs> or sort of leftist leftist terminology, like precarious workers. These are our demands. So it's sort of sort of uh, a unionized organizing language that that is being apply to these and that also identifies it as activism to me, right? Like they could phrase it in a different way that it would make it sound more like, I don't know, a, a, another type of organization, but not necessarily um, a kind of grounds up organization that, that work kind of labors or that, sorry, that, that um, tries to help a particular profession. So the architecture lobby is, you know, a pretty established um, force within that. And then there's other forces within profession. This is QSpace. They're kind of under, I don't know, they haven't been doing too much in the last few years, but they're just a really good example of a GSUB um, uh, uh, group that I think, I don't know if um, QSAP still exists. They they were founded a few years ago at GSAP. And I know that now there's like a whole ecology of different groups, which is great, but I think QSAP was maybe the first one, and maybe I'm wrong on that, but at least when I was a student, they were kind of very prominent, they were hosting happy hours, and and for the end of year show, they did this really beautiful installation where they basically marked up the bathrooms at Avery, and you know how, okay, you know how now there's the gender neutral bathroom on Avery? Um, yeah, so, so that's basically thanks to them, because they, um, um, you know, called the school out for that, and they, they did this physical installation where they marked down how the building code is um, a sort of segregating or kind of like reinforcing gender roles within the bathrooms for it. And honestly, it's still the best end of year show I've ever seen. And so, um, um, you know, that, yeah, it's, it's activists, but in a way very much within an organization, you know, I mean, funded by an organization and, and working within it, but actually uh, uh, creating change. Another, you know, form of activism within, within the profession was the architecture, shitty architecture man list. Um, and I'm pointing that out because, I mean, Lexi showed a lot of really cool and sophisticated tools that are being used now, but it can be as simple as, um, as a, you know, Google Doc or just a list of things, right? Like explaining, um, 
uh, what has happened and, and putting that into format. And I think in the context of blended learning and you know uh, our online situation, this is really interesting too, because this is a kind of activism that wouldn't have been possible um, before people got together in collaborative documents on the internet. So, or it would have been possible, would have, imagine they would have had to write letters and stuff. It would be complicated. <laughs> so, so these formats are, um, are really effective. And um, I think in, in terms of, you know, Obama's comment in the beginning, I think this is different because it is very, it's not called culture for, for, for the sake of, um, you know, feeling bad about oneself. It's probably the opposite. And also it's anonymous. So uh, the architecture mandis was not, you know, undersigned by a particular person. So it's, it's definitely pointing out or criticizing a situation, but sort of doing it um from uh yeah so you know for, for to basically not even i know that at the time there was a lot of discussion about like individual people and so on and that it is problematic in many ways but it was more about the systemic change and, and about a way that culture that architecture culture functions and that that needs to be changed and about you know individual act individual people that were there um and actually i think lexi is on that list there was another list the buy studios which you know lists it's simple. It's uh, Lexi, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically just lists all like every studio that's BIPOC that so that, and, and create access to it so that people, you know, often when, when people talk about architecture, they're like, well, but there's no people of color. I can't invite a person of color to my panel because I don't know anybody or something. And well, it's not that hard, right? <laughs> and there is um, and there's a list uh, that you can refer people to also as a kind of working list to help them uh, 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 to help them you know, for students maybe to, to find employers or, or, or for just for any situation where you would, might, uh, where that could be a factor in, in, in or, for, or to find, uh, for clients to find architects and so on. So it's, again, list as a effective mode. And then uh, this is a British organization, uh, London-based New Architecture Writers. Uh, it's a free program that is for emerging uh, design writers and architecture writers and uh, kind of focused on black and minority ethnic emerging writers. Uh, and they're actually hosting an event, I think, like a bunch of events this week. So check out their web, web page. Um, they're really great as well. Okay. Um, so, oh my God, what is happening? Okay. <laughs> so the next, the sub chapter of uh, the within education. Oh my God, is this flickering for you guys as well? Or is this just for me? You see my screen flickering like crazy. Okay, I'm gonna just reload this. I think she needs to buy me a new computer. I'm having too many problems. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next, uh, you know, basically, I, I see it as a sub chapter, even though it could also potentially be its own chapter, is um, education based activism within architecture. So here there's one uh, by Public Works, um, it's called the School for Civic Action. Uh, and this is interesting because this is actually an educational experiment that is started by an individual studio, by an office, rather than by a school itself or, or you know, a group of organizations. It's a few years old. And I think the recent examples have been a lot more um, you know, collaborative focus and thinking about sort of ways that people can join forces to um, to create this kind of uh, um, like, like new syllabi, new forms of education, rather than sort of one group coming in and sort of creating a you know a mini public school in a in a in a, in a setting. So here, um, race, space, and architecture. And I'm sorry, my computer is something's happening. Oh my god. Yeah, um, Bika, I could also share, and then yeah, uh, do you wanna do you wanna share the screen? Sure. That way you don't have to worry about it. So oh, okay. I need to stop sharing. Yeah. If you stop sharing, I can share yeah. too. Um, um, but yeah, race, space, and architecture is um, a curriculum that's been actually developed over you know a few like multiple years, but really got a lot of attention. I think during um, the protests of this summer, and they basically developed a whole 
on free online curriculum that you can go through and educate us yourself about um, you know the, the, these topics and it's really it's really again is it activism is it education it's 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 something in between um, then um, this was a conference hosted at Harvard and actually student organized, which I think is really interesting. And it's been, I think, hosted in 2017 and 2019 again. And I mean, it's um, again, sort of, you know, bridging the institutional, the educational, um, but yeah, definitely sort of, sort of with, with an undertone of like, this is something that's missing and we need to bring it in. And this is a form of doing it is through the conference and then the, the next one um it's called dark studies it's actually not strictly architecture it's actually uh, a new online program that was funded founded this year so this this summer and it was um it's interesting because it's it's maybe one of the more direct examples of covid um you know kind of bringing out new formats because i mean you know, it could have happened maybe uh, before or after, but it, I don't think it's a complete coincidence that it has happened now. Um, and it's essentially an online only uh, uh, school that addresses specifically the things we talked about earlier. So it's it's meant to um, be for, you know, it's, it's meant to basically be for people who don't have access to regular education, but really uh, provide an open experimental format and a really, you know, there's Nora Khan is in it. There's just really, really amazing scholars who have that kind of background, but are coming together to really experiment and create a new kind of format in school. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, definitely check out their, their curriculum. Okay, so next uh, section is what I call cause-based organizations. So these are, you know, groups that have a specific kind of cause and try to advocate for it. Um, through um, specific action. So, and, and, and it goes kind of beyond the profession itself. So this is really kind of like out into the world. Um, one of them is uh, Black Space. So a kind of group of planners, architects, artists, activists um, who are really, you know, trying to affect change in, in the world at large. And let's go to the next one because I want to see that, yeah. So this actually, you mentioned design is for dyslexia, I think, right? This is one of the groups that you talked about. Uh, yeah, I don't know if yeah. that's what you mean. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so there, you know, again, the, the question of um, the terminology of like demanding something so that they're not asking for it. They're not like, can we have that? They're like, we want this. <laughs> um, all right, let's go. We're, we're actually a, a subsidiary of Design is Protest. So DMU is, is part and affiliated with Design is Protest. Okay. Yeah. Um, F Architecture Collaborative is an interesting one. It's actually GSEP grads. There are um, three uh, women who were at the, um, in the CCP program and they built uh, a practice based on, you know, Partially, I would definitely say based on activism. So they did a really interesting project. You can check, check out on their website that is um, called I Called and basically just asks people to call their representatives. So they did it in 2016 after Trump got elected and have been continued over, over the past few years. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work is more exhibition based, but this was one that I would say is very particularly activist in terms of like a call for action and then creating kind of a plan involving other people and then demand and then sharing that, you know, as part of their work. Um, and this is a, a beautiful, basically comic book, um, um, which is called, which is called Undocumented Architecture of Migrant Detention. So basically, you know, through a visual uh, storybook telling, telling a narrative, again, sort of an idea of reaching out beyond the profession with the tool of the profession. Um, so there's, you know, another, and, and, and again, there's a lot of interconnections, but uh, this idea of mutual aid, I think is really interesting in terms of, I think when we think of activism, we often think of like, well, it's, you know, we talked about anger before, we think of like, there's an issue and we have to rally around it and kind of protect, protect something hierarchical, something above us that we have to, where we have to affect change. But 
community-based and mutual aid, and this is a really good article if you're interested more in, in, in mutual aid um, by Gia Tolentino. Um, it's linked on the, on the left-hand image. So she talks about how during COVID and specifically New York, you know, this type of mutual aid just became something everyone, everybody did. Everyone was trying to help their neighbors. It, it kind of activated people's um, need to actually feel connected to their community and to help them. And the that's the strongest example uh, that she gives where, you know, thousands of people signed up. And I think that is, that is a form of activist practice for sure. It's sort of, you know, is um, it comes from, it comes from uh, sort of, uh, I would say, an extreme political position and has kind of found mainstream this year. And so it's really interesting what's going to happen when the urgency of COVID is over. I mean, is that something that is going to stay or is that something that's going to move away? But it's definitely a tool set, you know, right? Like activism doesn't have to necessarily be uh, involved with the organization reaching out. It can literally just be like helping your neighbors um, but yeah, let's go, let's keep going. Um, so in terms of this kind of community-based activism, there's this really great comic book, Dick and, Rich, uh, Dick and Rick, and it's about these two characters um, that try to approach, approach community-based activism in their own way. And it's always like, you know, Dick does it the wrong way. So here you see um, how he's like doing pro bono projects. Um, for a community and in the end kind of wants to push his design through. And then um, Rick is really working with the community. So again, the, this, and, and basically gets their opinions, you know, works with them, isn't really concerned so much if that project gets published, but actually genuinely tries, wants to help them. But then because it's successful, what he makes gets hired again and so on. So check it out. It's like super short and really fun. Um, and it's by the Center for Urban Pedagogy and they have published a bunch of different tools and ways of, you know, really working with community-based practice. And then this was launched very recently by Van Allen Institute. It's called Neighborhoods Now, and it's a specific, um, you know, New York City um, local guide in a way, or local resource actually. Again, a tool set that is made by the community for the community. And if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, there's basically simple things like, diagrams helping to explain how, you know, uh, the New City restaurant codes work, how people can um, uh, uh, follow the rules and so on. And if you go to the next one, there's also specifically, you know, schemes for outdoor seating. This is, I think, by Soil together with some other architects. Um, and if you go into the website, there's basically pages full of different kinds of uh, resources that architects have created for the city. Um, during specifically during these times of COVID. And design advocate is part of that. And you'll recognize there's a bunch of GSA faculty on that image. So design advocates is actually advocates is um, um, you know another one of these platforms. I mean it's getting repetitive, but each of them is unique and different. Um, but they are they're you know really I think strong in that kind of community-based practice. They're all New Yorkers, they're doing local work for for New York, at least in this in this instance, um, and and that gives the strength of that kind of practice. It's sort of not coming from the outside in, but it actually tries to do things from within. And here, uh, an example that's a little older from Tukati Park. So this is actually Greta Hansen with Common Practice, um, kind of coming up with a you know kind of inflatable scheme in terms of making Tukati Park at the time of Occupy Wall Street more. Um, Occupiable, and that is something that uh, uh, Gia Tolentino mentions in her article that people who have been at some point sort of mo mobilized to become part of a mutual aid network or to become part of the kind of community-based practice are much more likely to come back to that. So once you awaken the spirit in somebody, there, you know, that it's kind of like once you're an activist, you're going to be an activist forever. And I think this is quite quite interesting in that context. So here, um, this is a uh, another one of these sort of resource-based practices is called Tools for Action Foundation. And when you go onto their website, they have basically uh, a bunch of uh, guides of how to build your own inflatables for protests. And there's really uh, basically a bunch of different blueprints you can be using. Um, and, and yeah, again, you know, um, a hybrid case, but definitely, definitely they've started doing that for their own communities, but then are making that, sharing that beyond that. 
uh, to connect. Yeah. Okay, this is this is the same page here. You see another installation that they did. Um, and then there was an exhibition fairly recently, two or three years ago, at, um, at the VA in London called Disobedient Objects, and they basically documented a lot of different ways of uh, that, that people have created protesting gear and strategies. And here are some of the manuals from that um, uh, from that exhibition. So another form of architecture activism, which is actually maybe you know, funny enough, maybe one of the most popular ones is called support based. So it's like the idea that you are from outside coming into a community and trying to help them. Um, if you go next. So yeah, I think design yard sale is in a way an example of that where, you know, uh, somebody was like, okay, how can we, we're gonna sort of raise money for that specific cause um, and do it through a, a method that is in a way disconnected from the cause. But it's, it, it's, you know, totally, it is activism and they raised a ton of money. And I think Lexi was in that too. She's, <laughs> she's involved in so many ways, but, um, and they're definitely um, social media, you know, COVID um, case where they they basically only, mostly existed on Instagram and that's how, and, and they had a pretty simple web page and that's how they were able to raise all that money. Um, oh, and the, the idea was that basically, you know, architects are creating work and then uh, donating that to the organization and then sending that, basically selling, there's auctions and they're selling that um, to yeah, interested individuals all over the world, and the, they were basically managing the shipping and um, and you know the kind of work for the, the the communication between these these forces. So yeah, I think a really really positive example of that. Here's just a classic. Uh, I think this is the project like ten years old. So it's called uh, the parasite, and you know a, a structure for homeless people. There's like endless variations on that. I feel like Every architecture school has made something along these lines, but it's definitely sort of clearly some an architect trying to solve a problem and 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 sort of thinking, okay, how can I make it better for a homeless person and creating some kind of prototype and then building it and also deploying it. But yeah, anyway, that's that, so we can discuss that. But I think yeah. So here, uh, here's a more extreme example, maybe the ur urban think tank um, building um, essentially better slums and calling it, uh, they call it empower shack. And yeah, I, I, you know, again, sort of an outside force coming in here on the right and then definitely using that also to exhibit and to show their work, you know, at the Biennale, they're, they're, they're really widely um, exhibited practice. And um, yeah, I'll refrain from commenting too much on that, but I think it's just a different way of, 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 of doing support and activism, okay. So, uh, you know, another form of activism, I would say it's um, analysis and research-based. So these are practices, go to the next slide. Um, I think forensic architecture is, um, they're in every single one of my lectures because they just cover so many. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I've seen those before. They cover so many different, different ways of looking at architecture, um, uh, except for maybe a conventional one, but they, it's a, it's a British London based studio by Ian Weizmann and um, you know what they do is essentially use technology like 3D scanning and um, you know really they're, they're really advanced technologies that they're using to basically uncover um, histories re recent histories or sort of often often military applications or ways that you know um, I think this is from from an incident where, you know, 40, 40 students died and that basically nobody knew what had actually happened and they came in and helped to reconstruct the narrative of that particular event and through architectural tools though. And I think that's a really interesting thing that they're, you know, using three-dimensional thinking and the way, you know, um, tools and education that we're trained in as architects. And, uh, you know, again, I'm not sure this is activism in the classic sense, but it is definitely uh, trying to, um, uh, in a way, rather than maybe identifying the cause, uh, kind of cause and trying to find a solution, it is sort of helping, it, they definitely have an agenda and uh, ideology, and then they're helping to basically uncover certain truths through research and through analysis. Um, yeah, and then Dark Matter Labs is, an, is another really interesting um, organization. So they're, 
um, basically working also kind of a high tech team, high tech tools, um, you know, working, but with, with uh, sort of a strong social mission. And I think that's actually quite rare and unique and really interesting. And they have, yeah, another, another project to dive in. Um, this is a little bit older a project, but just wanted to put it in there as a sort of archive that, you know, again, a research archive for, you know, how, as you've seen that this presentation was very current, it didn't really include too many historic examples. And so this is one where, you know, you want to, you want to kind of, it's more like a reference book and sort of, again, is it activism? I don't know, but sort of, again, gathering information for that particular purpose with, um, trying to find that kind of architectural knowledge. You know, I think at least counts in that category. Okay. <laughs> and then finally, the last category is, you know, I think something maybe that architects are most familiar with in some ways is sort of thinking about the future, imagining the future, drawing the future and projecting the future. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, I think a lot of architecture could fall into that. I here have just one example because it's so, uh, incredibly beautiful if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, this artist, Olaya Kanjefus, creates, you know, versions of, do you know, the, do you know him, Celeste? <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's just creating this Afrofuturist uh, visions of Brooklyn. And I think what's fascinating, you know, if you live in New York, is how you know these buildings. I think sometimes when you watch Black Panther, it's cool, but it's also fantasy world. Like, it, it's, it's kind of disconnected. From reality in, in many ways and so so these are very kind of you know uh, they're collages like very sophisticated collages in a way um, that allow for us to dream of a different future um, yeah and that's those are my six points <laughs> this was, this is a, so amazing I'm like, yeah his work is so I, I attended a talk that he did about a few weeks ago where he like talked about his process and stuff. Um, what, what did he say he makes these images in? Does he just, uh, does he also do all this 3D model or is he? In, yeah, in uh, he didn't really talk about like the tools. I think he, I don't even think he talked about the tools that he may use. I think like a lot of this stuff is like Photoshop and then he does make some of the 3D models. Yeah, but I don't think he talked about like what he made them in. Yeah, interesting. There's, there's, there. They have this really strange quality of the kind of being, like comic, in a way, like <laughs> or there's something about them that feels like that, and then it's hyper realistic too, you know. Yep, 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 yep. And then I can like totally see myself, yeah, just like walking like in between these spaces. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. So cool. Um, yeah, I guess just, you know, general question, if you guys have any thoughts on these, um, uh, if your definition of activism has in any way changed or if you're, uh, if there's any, any of these that you want to be talk, that you want to talk about more that we've seen. This is cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's like the, the one of, one thing that kind of stood out to me was like the, the certain forms of uh, activism that can be more easily criticized than others, for sure. Like, I guess there was one that was about, I mean, I guess mutual aid is not going to be criticized as easily as the one where you're from the outside and um, kind of reaching a lending hand in to, to you know, um, to kind of help the community. Um, you know, for example, I feel like the building project at Yale gets that kind of criticism and that it's kind of an institution that's coming in and, and making an architecture that's like not really contextual at all but is actually it helps the school it's like a virtual like you could argue in some ways that there's virtue signaling there you know so right uh, yeah yeah I, mean, I think the mutual aid networks are not beyond criticism either i mean one of the criticisms is that they in a way solve issues that um shouldn't be solved by people necessarily, you know, that, that kind of should be solved by state and therefore can kind of take responsibility away from the state, which I, I think applies in a crisis situations, but I think is, is, is definitely something, I think there was this, uh, one of the mutual aid organizations after COVID and Fox News was all over them because it's a bit this, 
you know, it's a bit this Christian of like Christian think of generosity where help your neighbor. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> that, that, you know, is, um, often temporary and often in a way an act of, even if it's your neighbor, it doesn't have to be somebody really far away that you're coming from the outside and could still be based on the idea of volunteering. I think it's maybe more about, are you volunteering, you know, to make yourself feel better, which also is okay, but, or are you doing it because you, it really becomes part of your practice. I think that's the crux for me in a way, looking at all these different modes is sort of like how, you know, how, how can these become just part of you instead of something you do as an extra hour in your free time? Right, right. All this right. is yeah. my personal yeah. takeaway. You know, I'm not, again, this is not a judgment of how people are doing it. It's just something where I'm like, okay, this is. <laughs> hi, 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 everybody also who's out there. Oh, oops, I just clicked on the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> is there more stuff that you wanted to talk about, Bika, in here? Um, no, those are just some stuff that is not architectural, but that I thought was interesting in terms of the way they're doing it. So this is a Kickstarter for Black Lives Matter that was selling stickers and just made like tons of money. And just just in terms of like modes and methods and techniques of organizing, I think, you know, funding schemes like Kickstarter are, are really effective. And then the other side was uh, a, a virtual protest. So, you know, the... Um, um, Mm -hmm. the the earth protests basically when they um they were all what are they called they were on fridays by basically teenagers that they, they they after after covid they couldn't do it anymore on the street and so they created an online protest so just a, i think the image itself is just suggestive i mean i'm not sure you know i think that the there was there's an article about it and i think the general outcome was like well this kind of protest is in the end it's not the same, right? Like you need to be on the street mm -hmm. to, to really achieve um, something with, with the kind of protest. It's a little bit funny in terms of like holding up that sign in virtual space. I think there's, and we've seen a lot of examples today of people using the internet in really smart ways to protest, right? And to organize. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's more just- But it's kind know, of like a example. Thing. Hmm? Yeah, but something going viral or something, you know what I mean, almost has more silent power than a Zoom where everybody's shouting, like with it from their yeah. own, you know, so yeah, for sure. Um, maybe we should just open it up to, to, to the people here. Yeah. Um, thoughts and questions and comments about um, things that we kind of went through today. I'd actually love to talk about, th I appreciate your, both of your talks. Hi, Lexi. I wrote you an email. <laughs> um, and um, I'd actually love to talk about mutual aid specifically in the lens of GSAP. Um, it's something interesting that has sort of come up with the urban planning action plan and letter um, that Jean was talking about earlier. And so like an initiative that kind of came out of kind of the COVID response that we strongly suggested to GSAP was the creation of an emergency fund. And then it was no surprise when, you know, just a couple weeks later, that's exactly what they did. It was kind of taking lead from, from the students after we initiated a student one for the urban planning community. And it's interesting because, you know, obviously this is stuff that we have, I have no idea, obviously, n none of the people in the GSAP community know what folded out with their emergency fund. Um, the aid, like aid still hasn't been distributed from my understanding. Um, it's taking a while. I don't know if the cap, like, I don't know what, how much was like asked um, by them. Um, but something that we learned from doing ours was, was the fact that the amount of money that we raised, which was about like 2000, you know, just a small amount, like pennies compared to what it costs to the education here at GSAP. But then the actual amount of what people were asking for was like far beyond what we could even begin to provide, obviously, which started to just like open up a question for ourselves, the planning students where we were asking like, okay, like, wow, like we had no idea even in the small pool that like the thing that the thing to help our fellow classmate and peer right now is actually like um, support with with rent, support with groceries, 
right? Like, I think like a theme that is underlying in, in what I learned helping write some of the letters is that like, no one talks about the intersections of, it's not just about race, but it's also about like the class divisions at GSAP and, you know, the spaces that you can't even begin to engage in the curriculum in a critical way if you can't even like um, support yourself, right? Like you're doing it for sustenance. You're not doing it just to work for the experience. Like you, that's a privileged position that not everyone can kind of come at, but then yet at GSAP, what happens is that there's no stakes right? The stakes are felt by the people who experience it the most. No one gives a shit if it doesn't happen to them. Uh, and that's what it feels like um, from faculty and admin. And, and we understand, I think, as students that like, you know, faculty care, they, they're trying to care. But it's, there's no coordination from people who actually have the longevity and institutional memory at the school to like actually champion it like they're looking at students like oh you change your culture you change your student culture if you think this is a problem you, okay fine we'll do it but I feel like there's not enough like like real critical questioning of what does mutual aid actually helping students across different programs, not just the architecture students, all students across all the programs that are like also not represented properly in some of these anti-racism action plans that are being rolled out that are coming down from a very top level, right? You can look at that anti-racism action plan and a very simple question you can ask is like, where are the students, right? And no one's kind of engaging in that. And yet we're constantly being like in these meetings, we're just like, talking we're supposed like the dean sent a message to like every single student group and is like okay we'll listen to each of you sure but what it like there's still we just feel like it's like these emotional at least for me personally it's like just this emotionally exhausting conversation that like still doesn't go anywhere and i know that like some of my peers on this call like maybe feel the same way that like it takes so much out of you to like prep over prepare for like one of these meetings like you're terrified because that's the thing there's like real repercussions for like putting yourself out there and constantly being the student that like cries in front of everyone and is is <laughs> emotional when it comes to talking about this stuff but like if for whatever reason like if you don't show how it's actually affecting you and being vulnerable and like putting yourself in front of people like this like faculty have no idea what's going on and how it's really yeah. impacting people i don't know sorry this is a bit rambly now but i just like no, don't be sorry communication is like really important and maybe like a meaningful way to actually push this conversation forward at gsap is like what what does true mutual aid look like beyond monetary beyond like like all of all of the, like but also satisfying that base need for like so that it is an equitable learning environment for students participating you know it, and then it filters back to the pipeline the access to like these spaces and that's where i think we really uh, at least like i really appreciate the examples you're sharing with how people are starting to share. it's it's just hopeful <laughs> is what yeah. i'll say but i mean I just wanted to, to, to like really I really appreciate like how your your candor in all of us and I have to I mean your your it brings tears to my eyes too because I definitely had a moment when I was on a call with Deborah Burke and I just started crying for sure like you know and I she was just like what are you guys actually doing and I was like we're doing so much and you have no like you have no appreciation for it you know and she just kind of saw us as being kind of annoying pesky you know it's like I feel like I really hear you on that and I hear how it's also like the people who are doing the most work are the people who feel it the most and it's really important that the mutual aid is and I, I think that that 
is a thing where it's kind of like you guys are doing so much stuff and it has to be with like people who like also aren't um, bearing the brunt of, of a lot of the work where you can tap out and be like, I'm tired and like, I don't want to do this for my own kind of, you know, self-preservation too. I mean, I think that there are times where it's kind of like, you don't want to give up that fight, but it's also the, the fight that you're kind of up against is like the list of demands of how to make architecture school equitable and the in, an industry that is not very equitable, uh, you know, give you know better hours like more financial aid more help like you know like all these things that you that people really deserve in order to be able to be educated right now in their home environment right they're they're it's to me it's like figuring out places where you can be empowered is really important you know um and i definitely feel like getting involved in dark matter university we're like totally open to anybody being like coming and being a part of it and that feels great because you're part of the conversations that you're part of are other people who are doing the exact same thing in their schools or or and basically like being like here's an opportunity like come be part of this opportunity like somebody speak at noma who wants to do it like you know and I, there's something about that that feels like you're around so many people and it's about building your skills and and the network of doing that just also feels really natural so you know like I guess I kind of brought that up at the beginning and I, I, I like am as frustrated and you know, like I wrote you back an email when you told me about all this stuff and I was like, I really hate that as somebody who is an adjunct professor that doesn't get any healthcare that I'm like passing along the baton and saying, I kind of totally feel your pain. And, you know, and I, I think that that's kind of unacceptable, like that, you know, that just keeps happening. And, and I don't have, I wish I had a better answer for that, you know, other than to keep doing what you're doing, you know, but also take care of yourself. Um, yeah. Do you guys have other thoughts? Do other people have thoughts? So my unsatisfactory answer. <laughs> well, I think that's a big struggle. Like, so Camille and I obviously have been in a lot of the same things. Um, so yeah, seconded to everything Kuna said, but I think the, the problem we've been having is like, no one seems to really know or understand who is making these decisions. So, you know, in our, in the action plan we released, we got very specific in terms of, we were like provide fun, like seed grants for faculty who are working with local community organizations or, you know, recruit more actively at, um, historically black colleges or, you know, start a summer program for high school students in the city at public schools. And, and so we had all these specific ideas, but essentially every, everybody that we had a meeting with that we talked to, they said, we don't control this, like either because of money or some organizational, like I don't have the authority to approve this. But, and, and we got that response both from faculty and the program director, and I'm sure we will hear it from Amal if we meet with her. And so it just seems like, is there, is there a way for faculty who agree with some of these things and students who are on board to like make GSAP stop? Because I feel like that's, that's, the, that's the attitude that GSAP has is like GSAP must go on. In fact, it must go on. And so they're like raising tuition and doing all these things just to like make the semester happen, calling it a hybrid, but you know, it's not really hybrid. <laughs> and, and they just continue to ignore all these voices. And so I feel like we, and this was something at the New Grounds for Design Education and um, Dr. Sutton, who wrote that amazing book was on that call. And she basically was like, you guys need to make more noise. And like, I forget the term she used, but she's like, where's the juice behind yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And she, she's gonna, I'm, we're also hosting a DMU is hosting a call that she's on on Thursday about like, um, uh, um, about public education. And just like, I think that a lot of the same things are going to be discussed about public education and, and the difficulties of like privatized, you know, and all this stuff of basically being like, where, where's the teeth if, you know, like, all the students kind of have similar demands, you know, it's about like doing something outside of the school. It's also the tuition. It's also like support networks for, for younger professors that are doing stuff. And I think that like, 
there should be more Jews. There should be people getting more angry and there should be people who are, you know, I mean, I, after I started crying with Deborah Burke, I was like embarrassed, but then I was really glad that I, it, it, it happened because it was a way for her to understand things. And I, I think that, you know, one, one thing that we as faculty could do, you know, is to, because they're more adjunct faculty than any, you know, you know, more permanent faculty is like banding together for that. And I think that one thing that at, did happen at GSOC, which makes me, you know, hopeful compared to other schools is the faculty banding together to write the unlearning whiteness thing, which didn't happen at other schools. Like no, no, you know, faculty members at other schools were also kind of, you know, leaning out to do that. So I feel like there, and a lot of those people who are on, on that were part of DMU. So I definitely think that I, I could bring a lot of these concerns to DMU because, um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of us are the, you know, minority teachers that are, are teaching at GSAP or are teaching at different schools. And so like there is leverage there that like we should definitely be talking to you guys about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, thank you. Thank you both and all of you for, for, for sharing. I'm like, really moved and happy, happy this is happening and a space for that to talk about it. It seems like we need more of it. <laughs> um, but um, I'm curious, actually, I have a question for, for you, for you guys, for the students. It's like, how, how do you feel has this last, you know, the, this, the, I guess, COVID or the situation changed your level of engagement in that sense or how, has it kind of radicalized you in a sense, or do you feel like those issues were there before and just weren't talked about, or, you know, it, it feels like right now a moment where so many things are bubbling up and so many organizations are happening and schools are scrambling to respond. And, you know, so I'm just curious how that has changed from your perspective. <laughs> I can jump in, but I, no. I'm a, like a specific case because I actually grew up in Morningside Heights. Um, so I've always sort of been around Columbia and I, and I was aware, I also did my undergraduate there. And so I've always been aware of this relationship, this very like contentious relationship that Columbia has with its neighbors. And that's always been very like forefront in my mind. And I've always wondered why more people at Columbia, especially in undergrad, um, uh, don't talk about it more or sometimes are just wholly unaware of it. Um, and, it's, and then when I got to GSAP, I think uh, like more people knew, maybe because it's a slightly older crowd, but still for people who are studying the built environment, like sometimes I'd be shocked that they didn't know the relationship of their own school um, to, to the city at, at large. Um, and so I think for me, the summer felt really like an opportunity for us to like come out strong and, and really say like, what does it mean for Columbia to confront this relationship that they have? Like, we cannot build a time machine. We cannot go back and undo things. Like they happened, you have to acknowledge it. And I think Columbia is not even really there yet. I don't really feel the sense that they've fully acknowledged or like even understand the impact that they've had throughout the years on Harlem, Washington Heights, like all these surrounding neighborhoods. And, and then also then to like do something about it. Because, and, and the fact that you don't have more people from Harlem, which is literally our neighbor at the school at GSAP, I think is really, it's really problematic. And I'm not saying that the, it's not, like in some ways it is also a reflection of how New York City is. New York City is really segregated and like those boundaries between between neighborhoods is, is hard to bridge. But, you know, I think Columbia, because we sit on that boundary, like it, in some ways it's our responsibility to address that, but it doesn't seem like the school, the university is ready to go there. Yeah, they're not, I was gonna say they must know. There've been so many articles written in the New York Times about it, but um, yeah, like you, like you said, they're just not. Yeah. It's like how you can see something, but choose not to like internalize it. And I feel like that's where we're at. And so I, this summer I felt like it was a chance to really try to get that heard. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing, you know, in terms of even like proposing that like 
you know, students could get credit and get, you know, um, there could be a, a, like a funded seminar to do things that were actually in, you know, in Harlem and in Morningside Heights or like going to high schools and doing stuff with, you know, like architecture students and just trying to kind of integrate that into a course, you know, because I think that the university becomes overwhelmed with how to address that in like a kind of larger way or to address that, you know, like the university, you know, has been really exploited the community, you know? I mean, I think that they, it's one of those things where it's like that they probably know that, but nobody actually wants to say it, you know? So how are there, how, like, I think that's the thing about like, you know, at least at Yale was like, we couldn't get anybody to admit the wrongdoings that Yale has done to their, the community. And like the things where we started to get them to budge were where we were like, there needs to be a liaison that does this. And so they were like, let's fund a, like almost like a TA position. And then that TA position becomes important enough that it becomes a full-time position. And like, you know, like that kind of thing is, and, and unfortunately it, it it's, maddening but it's like the kind of small incremental changes do make a really big difference you know longer term um yeah i think that that one thing that is hard about it is that the you know the kind of um rush and about even doing the new grounds for design education where i think that we are all on that call and all got like super fired up i feel like as it goes on it's kind of like like the stamina to maintain it like is 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 difficult you know um yeah yeah i would say that too i mean i think um you know you guys definitely have uh a lot to deal with but you also have an opportunity i think here to you know to make a change and and and, and to go along with that moment of, that wave of change that is that is happening and, and i know it feels too slow but it's there and being at the school for a little longer i see how it has changed and it's it's you know, that list that, oh my God, I was teaching ADR for years and I was trying to change that list every year. And it was me and three white men. Well, actually far as I, okay, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half white men. But it was, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was just, and, and I remember uh, from five years ago, I remember having this discussions and, you know, eventually I gave up because I was, uh, and, and I don't know if you knew Lexi, but before, when I came in, there was, you know, there were like a few women when you, that you, that you put in, that you kind of underlined in red. And I think before I came in, it was like one or something, and even just the geographical distribution. So, so those are small changes, right? But then this year, uh, I think with, you know, th there was just an opportunity and you guys took it and completely reformed it. And it was possible to do it because everyone, everyone recognized that there needs to be a change. And so these are the kind of stuff, this kind of, these are the kind of things that maybe, if you're soon, you don't see it yet, but when you're there for a little bit longer, these are these are the moments. And right now, it's definitely a moment where you can just grab these things and take them and change them and squeeze them and modify them, right? And and so I think, yeah, I, in that sense, I feel optimistic. And you know, I think that, and I'm excited to see you guys here and talk about this. And I think we should, you know, uh, yeah. yeah. I think I think as Alexis said, the the crucial thing is to keep the <laughs> to keep the stamina and to keep, it keep it keep the stamina. But it's also like the reason DMU was formed formed in the first place was because we were like we cannot make change within these institutions themselves. They're already like ex so extractive, and they have such a history of being extractive that there's no way to do anything except outside of it. And so I think that I'm mean, like really hardcore recruiting you guys to become part of DMU because I think that you'll be much more fulfilled by it because it's like, you know, I don't know, like when you start to just be like, why don't you get it? Why don't you get it? Why don't you get it to the school? Like, and people keep passing you around. It's kind of like your efforts are much better spent elsewhere. Like, to be honest, like I, I do, I feel like they need to hear that. And I believe in, in, Sharon Sutton's like idea about us having more teeth, but I'd prefer for that to be in something that we are really building, right? Like the idea that historically black colleges and Ivy League schools can develop curriculum together. Like I can create a course with Curry Hackett and make amazing graphic design with somebody that, you know, like I've only met once, you know, and, but that we like now just super get along and see eye to eye and we're sharing syllabi and all these different things, you know, it's like finding those opportunities, but then also like, you know, becoming, I think that's 
part of why becoming a teacher, I think is like really powerful as well as to like, you know, figure out how you can make your own rules, you know, in whatever way. And I know that like being a student right now feels frustrating because you're in a system that is unfair. And there are a lot of things, especially this semester that are really messed up about your access to education resources, you know, like what you're paying for your teachers, all of that stuff. And I think that, you know, the, this experience that you're having in terms of building, like even the coalition between you guys as students is like finding like-minded people and like the solidarity that you build out of that community is like super important. And I think that like flagging all this stuff and realizing that, you know, institutions are super slow and like, you know, unwieldy and, you know, they, like Amal doesn't want to apologize for like 300 years of, I don't know, I mean, I don't, it's less, it's less than that of when Columbia was founded, but like, she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to apologize for that. And she won't, you know? Um, so to me, it's kind of like saying, I, I know that and I can be critical of that, you know, as, as, you know, after school, for instance, and during school, you know? So like, I'm not saying to, to, to like, you know, give up on it. I'm just saying that it's, it's about kind of picking your battles and the ones that you feel like are where, you know, the changes that you're making, even in like leading a discussion, for example, in your, in your section or calling something out as being like racist or misogynist by one of your professors. That's super important. Like I've, I've called out other people that I've taught with. I've called out, you know, friends, you know, like, you know, doing that to me feels like having those hard conversations feels like that's, that's a change that happens right away. You know, the person getting that. So um, yeah, there, I really commend the efforts to be doing, you know, this kind of change. And I wonder if, you know, the, the hard thing about Columbia to me is that like, there's not organization amongst the adjuncts and there's not organization like in terms of how we're kind of a collective body. Like people like in being at Columbia to like being a teacher that's at an airport like you, people are coming and going and you, you know, like you, you don't really know what everybody's doing, but it's busy, you know? So like, I think for that reason, um, have you guys figured out a way to, have you found your allies and faculty members and stuff? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just yeah. one more thing. I can be really honest and I don't know, Camille, if this is like where your head's at, but for me, it feels a little like it was, I think we had this one very discouraging meeting last week, which kind of put like a nail in this coffin with this letter. It was kind of, it was a meeting with uh, all the planning faculty, all the full-time planning faculty and Wei Ping, who's the program director. And it just, it kind of, they were just, they shut it down essentially. And, and I definitely agree that, or I'm at a place where, <laughs> Let's see, I'm like so on board for Dark Matter University, like, yes, please sign me up. But it's also that, like, the, the students that are, that wrote this letter, the students that are invested in this stuff, like, in a way, we're invested in it because it matters, like, to our day-to-day -day as well. Like, the, the things that create barriers for other people to be at this school are the barriers that, like, students face day-to-day. -day. And I know, like, I work multiple jobs, Camille works multiple jobs, like we, and because in grad school, you know, the assumption is you're an adult and you pay tuition, you pay your rent, you pay your bills and you find a way to make it work. And, and I think the point in a lot of our letter was that like, apart from the admissions issue of, of people not applying here or getting in here, it's like once you're here, even as like as a person of color, as someone who's from even a slightly disadvantaged background, you're like, you're amongst so much privilege. And I think it's like really hard to get your bearings sometimes. And because you feel like you're alone in like having to figure out just how to make it work. And, and what, like when the school doesn't provide the support you need for that, like, I feel like it really affects your ability to like do school because school is still necessary, right? If you're thinking about, I want to be an architect to support myself later in life, you kind of have to go through these cha official channels. And so while I would like love to throw 
all the energy I throw into school, into dark matter university, like there are still some stakes there where I have to consider like, what does it mean if I low pass studio because I don't agree with, you know, like the pedagogy of GSAP and I decide to do this other thing. And, and even with the urban planning action group, you know, some people in our group has, have been asked like, are you going to be able to focus on, you know, this TA ship because you know, you have all this other stuff on your plate. And I think like, it is a real concern, you know, they're only 24 hours in a day. And I just feel that the, the students who put the time in, whether it's into Dark Matter University or, you know, the Urban Planning Action Plan, like those are the students who are there because it matters and they're being affected by all these other things that we're like trying to change at the same time. Yeah. Like that's like not acceptable that you know, I mean, I think that they must be having a hard time figuring out how to, how to have, a, you know, it's, it, it does seem like it's a systemic thing for, for them to kind of address and to fix. And I think that that's partly why they're probably passing it off. But I mean, I'm upset by that. You know, I'm really upset that this is something where, you know, it's, it just seems like the, and I don't know the urban planning department and that well, you know, but if there are things that I can do and, you know, people that I can write letters to in my limited, you know, like non-powerful situation, I'm happy to, to ban with you guys on that, you know, so it's, it's super real, you know, and it's like, um, I think that, that like, you know, crusading for this thing and really getting it to happen and also the, like obviously you guys are are takes a lot of energy to do all of that you know and i really commend you guys for putting that in putting that time in and it's important you know so yeah i don't have i don't have i don't have answers unfortunately but sorry um, to bring things it I can so do what'd you say sorry to bring it so down <laughs> No, not at all. You just had a really real very topical. that kind of like brought us from here. To no, but I, I think this whole thing about activism and labor and like putting all the time into doing it and just the amount of organization that is like really required to like make meaningful change happen. It's like you guys are doing that's a job. You're doing like another job on top of all the other jobs you have to do. Do you know what I mean? And so it's just like, I hear how it's just so maddening, you know what I mean? And I think that if we can distribute that and find coalitions, like I really think that Dark Matter University should try to do some stuff and talk to you guys like that. Maybe we can set up a separate call or something with Justin Garrett Moore, who's also teaching at Columbia. And I, I, I know that these are people who are also well-versed in doing this kind of work. And I think that um, we should, you guys should email me or I'll, I'll email you from the of your email, but let's figure out a way to get on a call and um, put some pressure on them. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the workshop on activism just leads to like more concrete activism, <laughs> which I think is correct. That's the right thing that it should uh -oh. be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think that once you, once you get into it, it's kind of like, I don't know, it can be exhilarating to have a community and, and really be like, what are we standing for and what are we doing? And it's in some ways, I feel like it's kind of one of the most powerful things to get out of an education is doing this too, so. And also, I mean, I think it's like a lot of things that during, being a GSEP just generally is incredibly hard, but I think these extracurricular or outside of GSEP things that are still related to the profession you know, I think you'll take them with you and they might be part of your practice. And I think that's also going to be really exciting how these practices are going to look like in a few years from now that, that were fund, founded, funded in your, in your being, in your, in your activity right now. So I think that's, anyway, but that's, you know, something that I, I think looking at all these different angles and practices, I think is, is going to, to come out of that and that, yeah. Yeah, and the urgency of it. I mean, like it's it's clear, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, the support network is is growing and is trying to be there for you. So, yeah. 
Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, all. thank you. Yeah, super. Thank amazing. you, Lexi, so much. And um, all of you. And um, you know, let's keep talking. You have you have our contacts and um, again, I mean at the very least, Danielle's getting an email tomorrow that there's some stuff you have to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um all right have a good night okay relax yeah. we're, we're gonna get a drink now so <laughs> <laughs> you should too okay all right bye, bye. bye.